Have you ever been confused by all the information out there on the internet and here on YouTube about using fingers when playing doubles? If so, you're not alone because this, this can get very much overcomplicated. And so what we wanna to do today is just simplify it, demystify it, and show you what should our fingers actually be doing when we wanna play loud, big, open, and fast doubles. Basically, your finger's job is to actually reinforce the rebound that's already there so that you're able to increase the volume and therefore the speed. Your fingers are increasing volume and speed, which is very important and very powerful, but you've got to make sure you're doing this the right way. But of course, don't worry because I'll show you exactly how to do this. We'll break it down step by step so that you'll be strengthening your fingers, quickening your fingers, and using them exactly as they should be used when you're playing a double stroke roll. You can do this. Let's get going. Hey, while you're here, grab my free gift to you, free PDF e-guide in the description below. Unlock your hands for maximum speed, volume, and control in four easy to follow steps. We're making sure that you're holding the sticks right. There are photos in this, in this guide. You can take this guide to your practice room and be looking at this while you're practicing. Make sure you're gripping your sticks right. Make sure you're using your fingers right. What we're digging into today, harnessing the power of your fingers for maximum control and agility when you're playing. You'll also begin to eliminate your weak hand. And of course, most importantly, you're gonna know exactly what to practice. This is your physical, tangible thing to take to your practice room to make sure you're working at all of this stuff regularly and getting results. Results is what it's all about. I want you getting results and being able to fluidly navigate around the kit and nail your favorite songs. And so this guide is really gonna help you do that. And it's definitely your companion to this lesson today. So be sure to check it out before you go. In the description, the Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. Why do we need to learn doubles or fast singles and incorporate a lot of finger work in the first place? Like why is this even important if in most songs and most styles, we're not gonna be sitting here going or why, why should we work at all of this and put so much focus on doing if we're not really gonna use that in musical context and it's not really gonna be a part of our musical vocabulary on the drum set? Well, I get that question from students a lot because I have students work on finger strengthening and playing quickly and playing quickly and quietly and quickly and loudly. Those are things that we work on. And so the big question is often why? And if you're one of those why people where you struggle with really uh, getting on board with something when you don't really understand the practical purpose behind it, this lesson's definitely for you because we're gonna talk a little about that, but of course we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of how to do this. But the big reason why you want to build finger strength via finger singles and via big loud doubles that incorporate the fingers isn't just so you can do those things. Those are great exercises for maintaining that strength and you know keeping your technique sharp and building up those abilities, but that's generally not the application. The biggest drum set applications for finger work are actually molar, which starting out when you're doing like a molar two stroke kind of thing on the hats, there's not really any finger going on. It's more of this motion, this wrist thing, but as you get faster, there's a little bit of subtle finger action that has to happen there. And if you're playing over on the ride and you're doing more of a French style, then that does weigh pretty heavily on fingers, especially if you were gonna play some fast timekeeping, because a lot of timekeeping, quicker timekeeping relies on fingers, like. if you've ever heard the, the Ray Charles song, old Ray Charles song, What I'd Say. It has this crazy drum part where you're doing this quick thing on the ride bell, but it literally is just doubles. That kind of thing where there's never more than two quick notes in a row. And if you can play doubles well, you can play that well. And if you ever need to do quick jazz timekeeping or funk timekeeping, if you want to play something that's like... Um, that kind of thing, it starts to weigh on the fingers. And so if you wanna play those types of things well and you wanna be able to play quickly, finger work is really a core part of that, whether you realize it or not. Also ghosting though. So if you wanna be able to play ghost notes well in a groove where there's a lot of quick little ghost notes, 
A lot of that weighs on the fingers. And if you ever want to be able to play snare cadence style grooves well, or to insert snare cadence style things or little licks or drum rolls that you might want to throw in into a little fill instance, a lot of times doubles are part of that or buzzes. And a lot of times there's quick finger work involved in that too. And so there's a lot of these little details, more nuanced kinds of things that you want to be able to reach into. You want to have these tools in your arsenal in Hoei so that you're able to execute them. But know that those are the big things. If you want to be a well-rounded drummer and able to keep time quickly and loudly and clearly, or play cool little kind of jazz type licks, depending on what styles you're into, or any kind of fast timekeeping or ghosting, that's where these doubles and all this finger work comes into play. So if that's not something you're interested in, okay, I understand. But if you want to be a well-rounded drummer who's able to work to the best of your capabilities and maximize your capabilities, these are things you need to be able to do. You don't want to be hitting a speed wall all the time. Uh, whenever you're having to play a fast song, like if it's quick ride or quick hats, you're going to be hitting a speed wall if you haven't worked at these things. And so I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to be able to play whatever song comes your way. So let's set ourselves up for success here. So we're going to break this down to the bare bones, bare bones basics. In order to play a successful double stroke roll and in order to scale it in tempo, you have to make sure you're doing it well when you're going slowly. We don't want to just go right, right, left, left, right, right, left, left. We're just playing two singles followed by two singles. That's really no good if, we, if our goal is to go faster. So really what we want to do is start with the very bare bones basics. The first thing I have every student do, the first thing I have anyone learning hand technique do is the free bounce, where we loosely just create a pivot point here with middle finger and thumb. You could also do this with index if you like. Just toss the stick down, let it bounce freely. The stick's really only making contact right here with edge of thumb and with that middle finger. Got all this room to bounce here because of the space in our hand. Then gently bring the other fingers in. So they're not putting pressure on the stick in any way. They're just here, kind of gently curved around, not really interfering. They're just there, ready to do whatever we need them to do in a little bit. Index fingers, almost like just a guide here, kind of a guardrail, not really doing anything active yet. But now, once you're getting comfortable with this, with both hands, it might be easier with your right hand if you're right hand dominant, then practice doing this, catching it after two bounces. So only two notes, one, two, stop. And remember that that second note needs to be purely bounced. We're not doing anything to aid it. We're not going, avoid that. Try your hardest to avoid doing that. So many students fall into the trap of where they're actually playing that second note. Don't do it. Make sure the stick just naturally bounces for the second note. Hand, wrist, arm, doing absolutely nothing for the second note. Then you're just bringing in the fingers to catch it and stop it right there. Then what you can actually do as we prepare to turn this into a slow double stroke roll, you can lift your hand on that bounce and catch the stick that way. By lifting your hand up, you're naturally catching it, and then you're preparing for the next stroke. Be able to do that with both hands so that then you can actually alternate with this. Right, left, right, left, right, left, and it's okay if it's not steady. We're not going for steady time at this point. We're, we're learning a technique and we want to establish a motion. So it's okay if it gets sloppy. It's okay if it's a mess. If it's like, okay, my stick's just said, oh, that didn't sound very good. Work though to start evening it out. As soon as you're able to get to and do it. As soon as you, you figure out how hard do I throw the stick down, how much do I let it bounce, okay. You start to establish this muscle memory. It starts to get easier, I promise you. It feels weird at first, but it gets easier. So practice doing this, where again, the second notes are purely bounced. So that means that really we're playing a true double stroke roll here, where we're just going right, left, right, left, right, left, which means we can scale it. That's the key here. We've got to be able to scale this in tempo because if we're sitting here going right, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, left, it gets stiff very easily and we very quickly hit a tempo wall. You got to be careful there. So make sure that you're doing this right from the very beginning and then just start picking up the tempo. Actually, it gets easier as you go faster. It does get easier because it's hard doing this in a controlled, steady manner when you're going very slowly.
if you're playing these as 16th notes, so you're thinking one E and a two E and a three E and a four, one, two, three, four, around that 100 beats a minute range, when you start getting past 100, that's where you really start to hear the gunk and gunk and gunk and gunk, where you start to notice, okay, these aren't even. As I get my doubles faster, we're starting to hear where they probably just feel sloppy and don't sound good. Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe that's what you're frustrated by. Either you're frustrated by a tempo barrier you can't push past, or you're frustrated by how they just tend to sound sloppy and you don't know how to get that even machine gun singles kind of sound that you know you want your doubles to have. This is where things get interesting because this is where we have to start strategically incorporating the fingers in the right way. Generally, that tempo is about 120. About right here. I'm not gonna claim perfect tempo. I don't have a metronome going on. 120 is probably about right here. So if we're one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. At that point, if you're trying to rely just on bounce, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, it's not gonna sound very good. And if you can get everything in time, it's gonna be heavy accents and light taps. Go, 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 go. So we have to start evening that out. Basically, the reason that this unevenness is happening is because, remember when we were going slowly. The notes were pretty similar in volume. The first one's still a little bit louder, but they're very similar. But what happens as we get faster is we're having to put a little bit more pressure on the sticks. This is what you might have done without realizing it. You've probably done this for a long time without realizing it, unless you're brand new to this. Where as you're getting faster, you're putting a little bit more squeeze on the sticks, so that instead of this, it becomes... The tighter you squeeze the stick, the quicker that second bounces when you press down. But you notice a bigger volume difference there where the first one is pretty loud, but the second one's much softer. And so what's happening, you're choking out the stick height. As you're putting that pressure on the sticks, you're choking the stick height, which results in a decrease in volume. So what we have to do, this is where the fingers have to swoop in and be the hero here in order to increase that stick height that's gotten choked out so that we can have an increase in volume so that that note that's become a quiet tap can actually rival the volume of the initial accent. So we're essentially using our fingers to throw the stick down harder on that bounce. So instead of this, where fingers are just doing nothing, instead we're letting our hand open up for that first note, and then we're pulling the fingers in just to strengthen that second one. Remember that the rebound wants to happen. So when you do this, the stick wants to rebound. If you're gripping well, the stick wants to rebound. And so we wanna use that rebound. That means that we could theoretically have a lot of rebound here for that tap if our fingers allow it. So we can go wrist fingers. That's the best way to think of this, just going wrist and then fingers closing in, hand closing to play that second note. This is what is generally, to my understanding, known in the drumming education world is push-pull. We have a lot of terminologies and there tends to be confusion among them, but my understanding of push-pull has always been this, where you're throwing the stick down and then you're pulling your fingers in. And so that's allowing you to get the same volume on the second note because of fingers as you did on the first note from wrist. Wrist fingers. I like to call this open-closed, open-closed, open-closed. It's the open-closed motion where your hand's going open-closed. Like you have your hand out, like you're shaking somebody's hand and you're closing it in, which throws the stick down for that second note. So remember without doing that, that's what we end up with. We're having to squeeze tightly, but we're actually not having to squeeze the stick as much now that we're using the fingers. So in order to make that second note in time, before we were having to squeeze the stick, we're having to put more pressure on it so that it happened more quickly. But now if we use the fingers instead, we don't have to put the pressure on the stick to make the note happen in time. We can instead use the fingers to make the note happen in time, which means we're not having to sacrifice stick height. I hope that makes sense. To you guys who are super analytical about your technique, I know many of you are, uh, this should totally make sense and hopefully this sheds some light on this whole thing. So just to recap it, so when you're not using fingers, you're having to squeeze the stick more to make the second bounce happen sooner which results in a loss of stick height, loss of volume. But if we use our fingers instead for that second note, that means we can still have the stick height, and because the fingers are throwing the stick down, we get the speed still. We can still go like that without having to squeeze it. So that way we still have the volume. So practice doing that. Practice going wrist fingers, open, closed, 
open, closed. And then what you can do to practice this is actually just play a shuffle pattern, sit there and go. It's okay if there's a tiny bit of wrist happening there for the second note. And if you're going slowly, it's very easy for that to be the case. But if you can let your fingers follow the stick, or fingers are always following the stick like this, that helps. That pretty much gets you in the ballpark. And as you go faster, you're totally getting that finger workout. So you can do that with each hand, that'll help build up that finger strength. So then because of that finger motion, we're able to get louder and faster while maintaining that stick height. We're not having to choke out. As we get faster, instead we can maintain the stick height and get that even volume. So that is it. That is a nitty gritty secret to getting to where you have that almost like a helicopter sound, machine gun sounding doubles that pretty much ideally sound like singles where we've got everything nice and strong. It's where the stick has to be moving within your hand. Your hand has to be loose and open and fingers following the stick and fingers reinforcing that rebound. Now, one quick side note, something I've noticed in, in my playing, if I'm doing slow singles, as I get faster, right about here, right around the 100 beats a minute mark, I start to cheat just a little bit and I actually do use my wrist a tiny bit to help with the second note because we're not quite fast enough to purely use fingers. There's always those weird crossover tempos where you're kind of in the twilight zone there and it's like, oh, I can't really use fingers, but I gotta do something if I'm gonna keep them even. So I've noticed that just in analyzing my hands as students have asked me about this, that as I'm going slowly and starting to gradually increase my tempo, in order to bridge the gap between this, no fingers, and this, fingers, I'm actually using a little bit of wrist. And so, don't be too hard on yourself here. It's okay if there's a little bit of cheating, a little bit of wrist usage happening around this tempo. Just make sure it's not a stiff. That's no good. It's okay to use some wrist there as long as your hands are loose. Something that I've noticed is that if you keep your hands loose when you're doing doubles around this tempo, even if you're not actively using your fingers, the fact that your hands are loose helps the fingers kind of follow the sticks and helps things not get too stiff. And so that's how you end up bridging that gap. So you can go from here. So I'm using, I'm just throwing the sticks down. Okay, now that I'm getting here, I'm using a little bit of wrist, kind of like a loose kind of sloppy kind of thing that allows me to use some wrist and some fingers. And then by the time I get to about here, about 120, full on fingers for the taps. And so just go easy on yourself there. Don't be too OCD about that, it's okay. But practice the one-handed shuffle patterns to help with that. I've shown you the mechanics of how this works, of how to break this down, how to practice this. I hope all that makes sense and I hope you're able to right now take action on this, go to your practice room, pull out your pad, start doing this along with me. It's safe to say though, you're gonna have to spend some time building up more of that finger strength so you can activate your fingers more. It's one thing for me to say, use your fingers, do this. But sometimes there's another to do that if you haven't actively practiced activating your fingers. Sometimes your fingers just don't wanna do what they're supposed to do because how many other things in life do we ever do that involve this kind of motion? It's just not really a natural thing unless you've played drums all your life. And so if you're new to this or you're coming to the drums later on in life, you're having to learn a weird motion that you, your hands have never really done before. And so that's okay, be patient with yourself. You can do this, it's gonna take some time, but here's some exercises you can do that'll help accelerate it. My favorite one, I just call this the French grip exercise. Nothing new, drummers for decades have been doing this. Have the stick right here, resting on the, the last joint of your index finger right here. Have your thumb right here gently on top and just go like this. Practice, it's literally just this twisting motion. Practice twisting the stick midair before you even touch your pad. Really, this is a great way to get comfortable with it. You're using your fingers, including your index finger here, to propel the stick. We're just doing this twisting motion. So try doing this first, bring in the other fingers. Thumb, all that thumb does, it's really just a counterweight. It's just here for stability. Obviously this doesn't work without the thumb. Thumb is here for the counter pressure. The fingers are actually moving the stick. The stick pivots up around the thumb, just like that. Wrist and thumb don't move. Practice doing big full strokes like this. Eventually you get fast enough, you have to start decreasing the stick height and that's okay. 
but make that a regular part of your practice. Work at that. And you can see up here from the top view, as I'm doing that, the stick's roughly right here on my fingers, thumbs about this angle. And as I get faster, the stick actually twists back into my hand a little bit more. So that's fine too. Just another little detail. You might notice that happening naturally. As you get faster, it kind of chokes back a little bit. But speed is not the goal. I don't want to throw speed at you and say, you got to get fast at this. That's great to get fast at this. But practice this right here, going slow and big, because that is what you use when you're playing and when you're playing and when you're doing molar and when you're doing all these other things on the kit, that's the most practical thing to practice here. So don't focus on getting super fast with this. Focus more on the bigness and using your fingers to really move the stick a lot. Do that one hand shuffle pattern and practice your doubles on a soft surface. I don't have a towel handy, uh, but if you've got a towel or like a, a foam pad or something or like a practice pad that has a soft surface, do that so you can sit here and practice your doubles more softly where you're having to very intentionally use your fingers more. If I were to do it on my leg, same story. I'm going fast enough here. I can't use my wrist for every one of these notes, but you can see how my fingers are very, very deliberate snapping motion. Bump, bump, open, closed, open, closed, open, closed. And so this, the leg roll, my first drum set teacher called this the leg roll, my first lesson, had me do this. It's tough, but it really helps build up your ability to use your fingers when you're playing doubles. Because you want even volumes here, not where it's all sloppy and messy. Try to get things even. Uh, depending on your build, your leg's gonna have different amounts of rebound. And so maybe easier or harder than it is for me, but do put a towel over your pad, play on like a sofa cushion, whatever, play on your leg to get that workout. That's definitely gonna help. All right, so we've covered a lot today and I wanna make sure everything's super clear for you. I always want you to know what your next step is. Like what is, I want you to be sitting there and going, all right, I know what the next thing is that I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna take action on this. I know what I'm gonna do first. Hopefully this lesson has shown you some very clear steps you can go through. But just so that you've got something tangible in your hands, download the guide I told you about earlier, the Fast Fluid Hands Checklist. You can print it off, have it on paper, you can have it on your iPad, either way, it's a tangible copy of this that you can have in your practice space to remind you of these things and help you as you're working on your grip and just those core fundamentals that honestly are the prerequisites to what we talked about today. So it takes you through the very core things to practice every day so that you can make sure you're doing those doubles well and you're starting to build up that finger speed. You'll learn how to hold your sticks the right way, which is huge. Uh, just knowing that you're holding your sticks the right way and being able to reap the reward of holding your sticks the right way is huge. Uh, gripping well, getting good rebound leads to better time, better feel, better dynamics. And so that's a key thing. You'll also eliminate your weak hand. You'll take those first steps to eliminating that weak hand by learning exactly what you need to focus on and exactly what to practice to make sure you're breaking down those weak hand barriers. And of course, everything in the guide will solidify what we talked about today, harnessing the power of your fingers to build speed and control. Because fingers help a lot with speed, but they also help with control. And that's kind of the other side to things that yes, we use the finger strength for quick timekeeping and ghosting and molar and all that. But we also use our fingers for control when we're playing, especially if we're playing quietly. Even if our fingers aren't moving really quick, they play an active role in our grip. And so that's why we want to train them well. That's something that will be very well solidified and clarified in that guide for you. And of course, in the guide, you've got the exact core steps to make sure you're doing all of this right. That's huge. Knowing your next steps. Uh, I think that should be like a motto for the fall or something. <laughs> know your next step. Always know what the next step is. So know where you're at, what you're working on, what's coming next. And so downloading this guide very well could be your next step. And within that guide are very specific steps you can take in your practicing. I wanna make sure that you master this finger stuff and I hope that now you understand why this is so important, why it's such a big deal. So get to the practice room, download that guide. You can do this, you can master these things, stick with me. All of you guys who are followers of this channel, loyal followers, thank you so much for hanging out with me and being a part of this channel, being fellow non-glamorous drummers. And if you're new, be sure to subscribe, join the club, learn the non-glamorous skills that actually make a difference in your playing. Know that you can do this, you're capable of this. You're capable of mastering these core things that are simple. Yes, they take some practicing, they take some work, like anything worth doing in life, but they're simple, and when you work at these core things, they affect all other areas of your playing, and then you can become the drummer you're meant to be, nailing songs and having a blast playing with a band. That's where I want every one of you to be. So, get to the practice room, take action, work at these things. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you in the next lesson.